Who's the... This meeting is being recorded. Um, I guess um, for everybody, really, not just those new, but um, we've been running these um, Future Teacher webinars and the Future Teacher Project for many years now, and all of the resources are available to you. we we'll put the link in the text chat. We'll do that again because I know when people <coughs> sign in, uh, text chat earlier. Uh, we leave the registration form in place until. Ron, your some of your words are dropping out again. Okay, you Sorry. you better you better do it then, Alistair. Okay, well if you keep the, keep the screen on there for the minute, yeah. Um, so uh, the registration form is, is still in there, as Ron was saying, uh, and we will very shortly be putting up the registration form for the next session uh, next month. And we will also be uh, really keen to hear anybody that might be able to support us on next week, uh, sorry, next month's session. So today we have um, a group of very varied speakers with us, but before we start with them, I think it's uh, worth us just saying, Lillian, do you want to say what the key messages were that people wanted to find out about from the form? Oh, gosh, okay. Um... I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> look that up very, very quickly um, because I haven't got that up right here. Ah, like sorry. I say, we're all, we're all, we're all just starting <laughs> from scratch. Okay, nearly there. Right. So I think um, quite a lot of people wanted to just, you know, what works for academic writing skills, but also the challenges for international students or students who maybe have been at work for a while and are coming back into uh, having to do some academic writing for the first time, uh, or they're doing very practical courses like engineering and nursing, and they don't like the idea of having to do like a 16,000 word essay. Our social work students are like struggling with that right now. And other people want to kind of uh, pick up a few maybe uh, tools, strategies that they can use in the classroom so practical things um and then some some nice new themes i think uh understanding student writing with empathy and objectivity i thought that was quite nice and news um ideas for supporting neurodiverse students as well so yeah those were the key things that people wanted to learn and i think that last point you made there lillian i think is a really key one that writing um, is a particular issue for people who are perhaps from a different language background uh, for our international students, but also for many of our students with disabilities, neurodiversity. And something from one of the previous sessions that may be useful for you to look at is the, the Doddle model, which was part of our mind map, where we look at different tools that will support um, students in preparing, planning, writing, drafting, etc. So with that, I think we can go over to our very first speaker. So if I turn to Teresa to do the introduction there. Yes, I will indeed. So I'm, I, I want to introduce to you, if you haven't come across her already, a wonderful open educator, Laura Gibbs. She taught online mythology and folklore courses for the University of Oklahoma for over 20 years. Hence, she is joining us at pretty silly o'clock over in Oklahoma at the moment. She's now, like myself, happily retired, and she writes tiny folk tales. Um, and because she's an open educator, you can find out lots more about her work at lauragibbs.net and at 100words.lauragibbs.net, which I really recommend. And certainly something not for exploring right now, but for following up at some point. She did the most wonderful keynote speech for us at, at the Open Educational Resources Conference. And I'm just popped the YouTube. So add that to your watch later list because I really recommend it. Full of wonderful ideas for writing and encouraging writing. And so I'm delighted she's joining us today. And Alistair, for our speakers, for our speakers, just to keep you on track, you get a little jingle of the bell halfway through and then at the last minute, another little dingle. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to be sharing my screen, but I'd encourage anybody who's um, you know, on their computer uh, or even on your phone, all the materials are at tinywriting.lauragibbs.net. 
And let's see if I can share the screen here because, okay, you cannot share while the other participant is sharing. So someone needs to take down that share. There we go. I am so um, Zoom in. Fingers crossed. Yep, that's working. Fantastic. So what you should see now is this Padlet that I made, and I would urge you to um, explore it. Uh, Padlet has added a lot of great new features that you can make it sort of like a slideshow. So what I'm going to do is click over here on um, uh, this, what I labeled the slide view in the left-hand column. <clears throat> and so presto changeo, now we're going to see the, the Padlet looking like um, a slide. Are you all seeing that or did it switch tabs on me? Yeah, we're seeing that, I think. Okay, yeah. super, super. So um, uh, the reason I called this Writing Genies is because the idea I have with tiny writing is that it's like a, a tiny thing, but it's really bigger than you realize at first, that when students write something very small, it can actually be full of ideas and, um, and, and really powerful, uh, even though it's, it's uh, very small in size. And so if you use micro writing or tiny writing, my experience has been that all your students can feel really confident about what they've done. And that would include say English language learners that um, Lillian had mentioned, neurodiverse students. Uh, tiny writing is a, a way for everyone to express themselves and then um, uh, share with others. And because it's so small, with tiny writing, you as the teacher and also other students can give really detailed feedback and there are real opportunities for revision. Uh, that was for me the most exciting thing about shifting towards really tiny writing uh, in my classes was that students did not just a better job with the writing, but a better job with the revising because they could really hold the whole thing in their head and realize that every word matters. Um, as opposed to that that 16,000 word essay, right, that Lillian mentioned. With something small, you can really focus. And so what I'm gonna do in this presentation is just very quickly talk about some popular forms of tiny writing, and I mean really tiny, six words, 25 words, 50 words, and then 100 words is the longest kind of writing that I've got examples of here in this Padlet. Um, so my students wrote, um, uh, tiny stories that we started publishing as books in that uh, first year of the full academic pandemic year in fall 2020 and spring 2021. And these books are online and I'd encourage you to take a look at it. We use press books uh, to do these books and the students were really motivated um, by that. And these tiny forms of writing fit perfectly on a page. So it makes the book presentation easy. So from one of those books, here's one of my students six word stories Pandemic December, newly empty chairs haunt Christmas dinner. To me, that's an unforgettable piece of writing. Um, and so that's from one of my um, students in the fall of 2020. There's a wonderful workbook that I can recommend on six word stories by a man named Doug Weller, who I believe is there in the UK. Um, he, this workbook is full of ideas that you can take and adapt to all kinds of settings. And Doug Weller himself is a wonderful writer of six word stories. He's published three books of six word stories himself. Here's one of my favorites, scuba diving, lost, suffocating, mermaids never resurfaced, right? So look at the, the layout there and the punctuation and, and the power of each word. And it becomes a bit like poetry, right? Which is exciting for students too, because it's poetry, but without all the complications of, of rhyme and meter, but just purely the power of the words. Last words, is this thing loaded? And there you notice he included a little picture of a, a gun there, uh, kind of as a clue in case you didn't get it. Um, and combining words and images is another great thing you can do with tiny writing. Pregnancy test, positive. Boyfriend test, negative. That's a great example of a six word story that really doesn't tell you everything. It doesn't even come close to telling you everything. It's just kind of a clue to a story. And I think that's why my students like reading tiny writing 
is that the, the reader has more work to do with tiny writing. You really have to bring your imagination to bear. You're not just having the, the author's words wash over you and you're kind of trying to keep up. Um, you're a storyteller too, because you're filling in the blanks. And these six word stories also make great writing prompts for that reason. Like if you give students, say this six word story, I guarantee you every student who writes an expanded version, like say a 50 or hundred word version of the story would write something very different because it's just a clue. Um, there's a, a, a wonderful project called Six Word Memoirs. I've got an NPR piece here about it that you can listen to. And it's a whole kind of industry now at sixwordmemoirs.com. This has really taken the, the teaching world, at least in the US, by storm. They have these wonderful books. They have teaching guides and materials. And my favorite of their books is called Fresh Off the Boat. Oops, Let me stop it there. Fresh Off the Boat, which is a, a collection of immigrant uh, six word stories. And it is just amazing. So I highly recommend this video as a way to learn about the, the book. And I, I put some examples here in the sidebar. Even Siri does not understand me. What is that in your lunchbox? No, I do not speak Indian. Right, and so you can see, once again, these six word stories are kind of clues. They're like pieces of a conversation. They're the distillation of an experience and they really invite the readers to, to imagine what the writer is trying to tell them. You can find six word stories in the wild too. I saw this at Twitter just the other day. NASA panics after asteroid fires back. Six word story is a headline. Uh, hint fiction is a little longer. It's 25 words, but it's still very elusive. I love this example from a book by Robert Swartwood. It's a collection of 25 word stories where there's a very long title, very long title. Story is still just 25 words, but even with that long title and the tiny story, you have to figure out that it's about Superman, right? So it's hint fiction. It doesn't tell you the whole story. There's a community at Twitter uh, that writes very short stories every day. VSS 365, and um, they put out a one word prompt every day that people use in their <clears> story. One of my favorite writers for very short stories, 365, is actually based in Oklahoma, Jeff Provine. He wrote this great scary scarecrow story horror is a great topic in uh, very short stories. Um, Micro Flash Fiction is another great Twitter account to follow. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but you can come back and, and read through these. I think you'll be amazed at what people are able to do and the size of a tweet. Um, two sentence horror stories. It's a Netflix series, super popular with my students. And um, they did some great two word uh, horror stories. Uh, this all is a twist on the use of the first person by someone who is not what you would expect to be speaking. Uh, 50 word stories, that starts to get more literary. And um, Rand Walker is one of my favorite writers of both 50 and 100 word stories. And so I put a link to his book here. He's got a great scarecrow story here too that is um, just 50 words, but pretty scary. And then just short of 100 words, 99 words you can do, because really it's arbitrary, right? Pick a number, any number. My friend Trail Kulshan wrote the beautiful book of stories uh, around the world from her time as an aid worker, uh, just 99 words each one. Um, and then I've written all these tiny tale books, uh, explore them, have fun with them. I work mostly now on African stories, uh, and I provide the sources and you can always go read an expanded version of it, but I think the hundred word versions are good too. There's a group, 100wordstory.org, run by the same person who runs National Novel Writing Month. Fantastic organization, brilliant book that they've published. This is a story from their book. I love fantasy and uh, sci-fi type hundred word stories. And so this is one of my favorite series, but you'll find lots of them. They're called drabbles by some people, 100 word stories. And so that's a good way to search for them. Um, Tiny Love Stories was a project at the New York Times, hundred word stories that readers sent in. Absolutely brilliant. And they also published a book of those. This one's so sad about someone with Alzheimer's, but beautiful. And as I said, Rand Walker, one of my favorite, very short story writers, 50 word stories, 100 word stories, and novels, whole novels written in 100 word episodes. I think they're brilliant, especially this one, Burst of Gray. 
one sentence word doodles don't necessarily have a word count at all. And Valerie Dumond writes these one sentence story collections that people send in. Some of these one sentence stories are actually thousands of words long. It's kind of an amazing grammatical exercise in English, but they're great for writing hundred word stories too. So here's a hundred word story that's just one sentence. Uh, that we wrote collaboratively in a workshop together. They're fun to write collaboratively, these one sentence stories, because you just expand by adding clauses and phrases, but never starting a new sentence. Post Secret, it's not exactly a micro writing project, but it's a really brilliant project that ends up being micro writing, where people take an image, write on it, and send it into Post Secret. They have, I guess, hundreds of thousands of them now. Uh, at Post Secret, they post new ones every Sunday. I'm a firefighter. I'm afraid the day might come when I'm not as brave as I am supposed to be written on an American flag, right? So there's um, a great example of image and word uh, together. Um, and then here at the end, I've uh, listed some really useful handbooks. They aren't exactly about microfiction, uh, but they're about flash fiction, which is to say a thousand words or under. Great book on flash fiction about prose poetry, which gets at that idea of how the limitations. One more sentence, make it like poetry and then flash nonfiction. So for those of you looking for writing ideas in a nonfiction context, STEM context, tiny writing works there too. Okay, let's see. Now let me find my way back to the Zoom and I'll stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you. That was wonderful as totally expected and rich with resource. And I think we're adding some more resources and conversations in the chat as well, which I'm sure will continue. Thank you so much, Laura, for getting up so early to share all that with, with us. As I say, I know you're, you're still busy doing lots and lots of things online. I think you've got something coming up quite soon. And if you do want to share, um, share that in the chat, please do. Um, oh, I, I don't have a link yet, but I will get it right. to you soon. Teresa, in about 10 days, I'm doing a workshop all on six word stories with a constrained writing group. And if anyone here wants to come to that six word workshop, that would be great. I'll make sure to get the link to you as soon as I have it. Lovely. Thank you. We'll retweet that through the Future Teacher account too, so that people can pick that up. Very inspiring. Lots of lovely reaction in the chat too. Thank you very much, Laura. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm a great fan of uh, Laura's micro writing now. <laughs> uh, I was before this session, in fact. So what we're going to do now is go from that, that kind of big scale, kind of conceptual, how to engage people in, in that whole art and craft of writing. We're going to go into how, how do you work that um, practically in an academic context, maybe not doing exactly the same sort of things, but when you've got a bunch of students in front of you, how can you help them uh, turn their writing into proper professional competencies? So we're really pleased to have Anne Tierney, Assistant Professor uh, in Learning and Teaching Academy at Harriet Watt University. And um, her background is life science and blended and online education. And she's going to explore the use of OneNote in a way to, to create and share online blogs between a cohort of students from both staff and student perspective. And she's going to introduce her colleague, Leslie, I believe. Thanks very much, Alistair. Yes, I've got Leslie Nizhinsky with me. She is a graduate teaching assistant uh, in accounting, Leslie. And she was a student of mine in our foundational course for our PG cert. So the course is called Learning About Learning. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about um, the reflective writing that we did. So I'm just going to share my screen. And just make that visible. Oh, yep. Always does it at the same time for some reason. We're all okay, right. So, yeah, already. Uh, Right, so we are going to look at um, OneNote to support um, writing uh, and reflective writing is something that I've done for maybe oh, coming up for maybe the past 20 years, I think, actually. So it's something that I have a lot of experience in in different contexts. But this is in a particular course, the PG Cert course for our staff and for postgraduates and professional services who teach. 
So the background to this, um, as I've said already, it's our foundation course. It's 15 credits. It's part of a certificate. We have graduate teaching assistants like Leslie who can do the first course. Uh, they don't do the whole programme, but they do the first course and they get credit for it. Uh, we used to use the blog tool on Blackboard, but then when we moved to Canvas, there was no... Um, no blogging tool. And so it was actually Rosemary who suggested that we used OneNote. Would OneNote work? Um, and it was it was a good idea because you can share the files, it's easy to access, it's free, everybody can get in and they can look at it. So we thought we would give it a go. Um, we also wanted to support reflective writing um, for the reasons that Jenny Moon put out there. I've just put four of the 18 reasons that Jenny Moon has for reflective writing. We want students to um, we want to encourage them to look at their, their own learning. We want them to think about learning in the way that they want to do it from their context. And the blog opens up that, that way to do it. It also encourages staff and students to talk to each other, you know, through, through the medium of the blog. OK, so let's have a look at how we set up OneNote then. So if you can have a look at it, you'll see on SharePoint, we made a, a set of different OneNote um, files. They were arranged in alphabetical order on first name terms. So the students were randomly, well, randomly according to name, put into these groups and they could share with each other, but they could actually look at anybody's blog at all. You'll also see that uh, the course team had a space so that the course team could also blog as time went on. Um, when you see the next um, screen, you'll see that there are instructions and prompt questions for each of the weeks. So every week the students were supposed to go in, do a blog for that particular week's topic, and then think about what it was that was important to them. We also, in the live sessions in the course, um, looked at two models of reflection. One was from Driscoll from Health Sciences, which is the what, so what, now what model, and then a more um, in detail model from Gibbs, which is a six step model. Uh, and we didn't prescribe a, a model of reflection. What we said is these are two examples. If you find another one that you like, then use that. We tried to be as wide as possible. Um, we gave everybody feedback in week one. Uh, and because of the size of the cohort, we had about 60 students. The students all then got feedback at two other points, which were chosen at random. So if they were doing a, a um, blog post every week, they would get three pieces of feedback from staff. And if other students were reading their blogs and commenting on them, then we would get um, informal feedback from other students on the course. So this is what the inside of the OneNote file looked like. You can see that there's shared information about how to use the blog, so there are instructions. Then there is a tab for each of the people in the group that is accessible to everybody in the cohort. Uh, and there are questions inside each of the tab just to guide people on what they should be thinking about for each of the, um, for, of the blog entries. Uh, and this is this is one of mine actually. So you can see at the top there, um, we were looking at the teaching um, perspectives inventory. So we got the students to think about what the teaching perspectives inventory meant for their practice, and then got them to think about aspects of practice that they could reflect on and what it was that they, they should be doing. And so this was my reflection. I, I did a blog. I will say for most of the weeks it worked out, it wasn't all of the weeks. Uh, and that's one of the things that we explored as well. So I did a blog alongside the students because I, I would like to model their, um, their behaviour by doing the same thing myself. And so that was one of the things that was important to me. And I had done that previously in other courses with undergraduate students. So from my point of view, um, the pros for OneNote were that it was easy to set up. Um, there was a lot of cutting and pasting and copying, but once it was set up, that was fine. It was very easy to share. So everybody had a Harriet Watt email address, so we could share it on um, SharePoint. There was a link on the VLE. So every time the students were prompted to do a blog, it linked to the OneNote files. Everybody can see everybody's blogs. Everybody can comment on each other's writing if they want to, and everybody can see the feedback. 
So, for example, I've just this week told students that in one particular person's blog, I gave them a link to some extra um, reading. I don't expect them to do it, but if they're interested, it's something that's an extra, um, an extra resource so that other students can join in with that particular student's perspective on a topic. I think, though, that there were cons, though. Um, there was an issue with saving files. Sometimes the server took a long time um, to save. Sometimes participants were not comfortable with letting other people see their work. And so what I said to them was do a blog on Word. Um, it is a long term commitment and the, the blogs trailed off um, during the, the length of the, um, the semester. And also three points of feedback was sometimes not good if you missed your blog the week you were supposed to get feedback. So that that was a bit of an issue. OK, um, Leslie. Yeah, OK, uh, hello, everyone. Um, so from, I guess, from a user's perspective, for me, using OneNote was the benefit, I suppose, in terms of access was it was always easy to find a link on the Canvas site, um, which you could bookmark to make it even easier to find. I had an alphabetical structure. So again, it was really easy to find your own blog and um, those of maybe friends, colleagues that specifically we'd quite like to, look, to follow. Um, for the content, having the prompts and the questions made it easier to determine exactly what to reflect on. So from a perspective of someone that maybe wasn't familiar with reflection, it gave them a starting point. Also in terms of being obviously the kind of online Microsoft content, the auto save feature was useful. And if uh, sort of as a safety, you could always do as uh, Anne said, you could do it in a Word document and copy and paste, and then you had a saved backup. Uh, next slide please. So how did I do it for myself? I would usually set time aside each week in my diary just to make sure that I'd, I'd made time to commit to it, usually the same time each week. I myself was teaching at the end of the week, Thursday and the Friday, so I tried to complete my reflections at the start of the week to have it ahead of the sessions. Um, I would write a general reflection first on how my week had gone, looking at my teaching and what I thought had gone well and what hadn't gone well. And then once I'd done that, I would usually use the prompts to then dive a little deeper into specific maybe areas or you know, memories from the week and how I felt about them. Um, and also it was useful to do this in conjunction with like any additional exercises we had that week for the, the course, because um, it tended to be they would usually link together. So it was good while well, your mind was fresh on the subject to do you know, both at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, things to keep in mind, sort of, that was based on one experience, was, um, you know, the prompts useful, yes, but it wasn't about constructing a reflection based on what you thought. The sort of course leaders wanted to hear it had to be something that was almost, I guess, in a sense, special and particular to you so that you could use it later for your summative assessment, because it was, as, I said, as I've got here, natural and authentic. It was some, it was a real reflection and not a, a constructed kind of narrative. Equally for me, I think it was important not to be afraid to be honest. Um, so if it was negative, I would write it. Granted, as someone who does suffer from anxiety, I, I probably do view my reflections a lot more negatively. But at the same time, it was good to have that there because I could go back later and actually then maybe challenge my own thoughts as to whether they were actually real or, you know, I had overthought it as such. And then going on that basis with the writing, it did help to do the type of sort of free writing for the reflection to, again, avoid trying to overthink or construct something. Um, and then if you liked, you could go back to it and sort of see how you could link it to the course descriptors. You know, if you wanted to do that, it helped to then see how what you were learning linked uh, to your own reflections and see that you actually were learning what was required for the course. Um, and yeah, not overthinking it was the, the sort of pivotal thing. Uh, next slide, please. And what did I enjoy about the experience? I am a very reflective person by nature. So for me, I like the chance of having a time each week to focus on my own thoughts of the week and how I thought everything was going. Actually, surprisingly, it helped ease my anxiety um, because I could see other people's entries and notice that, you know, I wasn't alone in my experiences. If a session hadn't gone, gone well, it maybe necessarily wasn't what I was doing. It was just something that happened to a lot of people. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting to go back at the end and read, you know, the earliest reflections to see how far you had come. So it was a good way of actually measuring the progress you had made, which made the, it made the, the experience end really positively, usually. Uh, next slide. 
And yeah, just from my own perspective, sort of, I guess, in a nutshell, the pros were it was easy to use and navigate. So you could find people easily, you could add comments. So that was all easy to use. The cons, I think, was unlike a lot of sort of things, you know, if it was like a social media thing like Facebook, you didn't get a notification if there was a comment or if someone had replied to your comment. So there was a bit more involved in having to kind of actively check it maybe more than once to see what was there. Um, and from my, my peers' perspectives, I don't think it, it wasn't an entirely reliable uh, software. So some people did lose entries, but I guess for me, as I said, it what you could avoid that by saving a hard copy somewhere or you know a, a backup. So it wasn't maybe it wasn't a, a critical thing, but it was something to be aware of. And uh, yep, that's absolutely everything. <laughs> Thank you. No, you've still got a minute to go. That's your last minute. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> well, I mean that that was that was sort of all of it. Overall, it was a very good experience. I could be biased that I am a very reflective and and anxiety sufferer, so reflection is something I do a lot. But I think it for me it was helpful to actually turn it into an actual exercise as part of a course because that was a very interesting and difficult thing to do. And definitely. Okay. <laughs> if I can just add one thing, um, we, we guide the students and tell them not to write any more than 200 words. Uh, because so I, I was laughing at the, the earlier one where they were asking for six words, but we find that <laughs> 200 words are achievable, but also everybody writes more than 200 mm. words. So it, it's a sense of achievement for everybody. Uh, and another thing as well is that if you're doing a blog every week, you cover all the topics, even ones that you might not understand very well or you might not be interested in but it gives you a way into understanding all of the course rather than cherry picking topics that you like so that that's my last word on the, the subject that's great thank you both very much and i'm actually genuinely surprised at the the level of um complementarity uh, between what you've been talking about and what laura was talking about i thought they were yeah. going to be slightly different things but actually they blend beautifully together there's quite a lot of um, comments and some questions in the text chat which we'll we'll have a discussion section um shortly after we've had the final presentation but you may want to have a look at some of those uh, and respond to them in the chat or um pick them up at the end of the session with lillian and uh and with oh it's gone out of my head amy is it <laughs> yes it's amy yes lillian and yes, amy. Amy. Apolo apologies amy a, a momentary uh, blank okay yeah, thank you so we will share our slides um on the website uh, after the session because we were still writing them this morning <laughs> or i was anyway and um, so i think the the way this joins up with the others, um, looking at the kind of range of things that people wanted to kind of cover, um, we have covered a lot of academic writing, uh, hints, tips, and guides uh, in the last two iterations of this webinar. So we have a lot of resources already on our original Future Teacher sites. So I wanted this to be more of a reflection. You know, we think we're telling our students all the things they want to know. Um, and so I'll, I'll just uh, go through those things uh, quite, quite briefly. Uh, and then Amy's going to tell us um, whether any of that actually reached the students as I think they have. And um, so just a bit of context, I'm in uh, like learning technologist, so working at the university and you kind of think, why is she teaching anybody about writing? So I don't teach people about writing per se, but because of the tools, oh, hang on, light's gone off, you can still see me, but because of the tools that students could take advantage of to help them with writing, that's where I come in. So quite a few lecturers asked me to come in and, and, and kind of talk to the students about what can help them with their writing. So back in 2017, um, Alistair, Ron and I were recommending tools and at that point for dictating, I, I was saying to people, oh, um, use a voice memo, you know, just record it on the phone and then uh, you can listen back to it and transcribe it by hand. But what we can do now with the technology that we have is you can speak and have the transcription happen straight away. Um, I, you know, I use Otter, other people use Google voice typing, uh, text help read and write is something we have at the university. 
Or you can just use the dictate button on your phone and see the words type out instead. And another student I was sharing this with said, oh, I just go into a Zoom call on my own, turn on live transcribe, and anything that I say, I get a transcript. So, so many ways to kind of get that writing out of your head down onto paper without breaking stride. This works for me because I tend to over uh, edit as I write. So this, this works for me. Then in terms of organizing thoughts, nothing's changed. We would still highly recommend you mind map, you do stream of, stream of consciousness typing, uh, and keeping the diary and reflective log. Ta-da! This is how we joined up with Leslie and Anne. Yay! So it's still good advice. And, and some of the stuff that we were supplying to students, right? So uh, how much do students know? So if I just show you what the slides look like that we used in previous years, we were collecting together um, from the audience. So it would be great if people here could add to this by... If you know at your university, you've got links that you ask students to go to that support them in their writing, do add it to the chat, you know, university name and give us the page and we can add to this list. And you can look across all the universities. What are we saying to students? What are we telling students about writing? And so then uh, at the University of York, we had two presenters come on. Lou was talking about note taking uh, and also, you know, so her slides are all there and the recordings there. And this idea of grid notes, you know, uh, as you read, make notes of what you're reading and being systematic about it. So you can spot patterns. And I use this personally myself, so I know it kind of works. Uh, and Jenny was kind of talking about the little tips and tricks um, for long pieces of writing. So her social work students are doing a 16,000 word essay. So I kind of pop in and support them with kind of ways to read easier or make notes uh, using paper pile to collect, you know, um, uh, notes about the academic reading uh, so that it supports the writing. So these are some of the things that I, uh, would teach her students about using voice dictation. And there's links to other resources from this slide um, about uh, even um, when they want to quote something and they can't copy the text, what do they do, right? They have to type it all out again. So showing them how to take a screenshot, upload it to Google Docs, which automatically OCRs the text. So these little tips reduce the functional issues with writing long uh, essays, long pieces of work, and they all really, really help. Um, and then making your notes usable. You know, if you handwrite, uh, and I still handwrite, how do you find your notes again, you know, so that they help you with your writing? Um, oh, and another really neat trick, which my students love, that removing line breaks. When you've copied something from somewhere, and you have to manually remove line breaks. Well, there's a tool for that. <laughs> so all these things make the writing process a bit more efficient, um, which stops you doing that procrastination thing. It's like, oh, maybe I'll just spend today removing line breaks or retyping quotes, which is a pro procrastination uh, trick, really. So these are some of the things the students said they would now practice, you know, listening instead of reading and then um, using speech to text. And, and which brings us nicely to the student perspective. So we think we are telling students all the things they need to know to help them with their writing. But Amy is now, uh, Amy's a bioscience student. Um, she, I've never taught her about writing. So this is like real life. If I had to randomly go and pick 10 students and ask them, what do you know about writing? And where did you get that information from? Um, this this is one example of what I would get. Uh, so over to you, Amy. Yeah, so I think from my experiences, obviously, I went into my first lectures and were basically just thrown all these pieces of software and never spoken about them again. So students don't really like know how to use them. And a lot of the focus is on, obviously, people learn in different ways, like some people are visual learners, some people like 
auditory learners and they kind of focus more on like the, the strict note-taking side of oh you take notes you write them and that's how you know that you're learning but actually that doesn't really work for some people so I think a lot of these software especially the um, like the text-to-speak software that's something that I'm going to start using that I've never heard of before and I've only found out because Lillian signposted it to me and I think a lot of students can benefit from this being instead of just said at the start of the year this might be available I don't remember learning about any of it but I think if it's put out um, throughout the year um, it will be a lot more accessible to students because it's overwhelming in that first week there's a lot of stuff to think about they're not going to be thinking about essays in the first week of term so um, when coming up to university students obviously experience a big jump in what's expected of them when taking responsibility for their own independent learning and that can be incredibly overwhelming um, they're told to make con like told to make notes on their content as evidence for what they're learning but people aren't aware on how to develop their writing and um, to adapt to their learning style or adapt to what's um, now expected them at university. Um, so students put a lot of their time and effort into making these notes, but it's often wasted because they don't know how to tailor this to their own needs. Um, throughout my first year at the university, um, I've learned a couple of helpful tips um, to help me be quick and efficient when taking my notes. Um, and I've been sharing this with um, my peers so that they can also improve their writing skills. So these are some things that I wish somebody had told me sooner. So um, when making lecture notes, put the objectives for the content at the top of the document so they stand out. This was one of the first things that I started doing and it really helps make notes a lot easier to organize, especially um, I did mostly open exams. So um, it's helpful for if you're navigating revision and you want to do a certain topic, you can see what that note's gonna contain and what it's gonna teach you. Um, and it kind of helps make things more time effective. So when taking notes for lectures, um, having the lecture tra transcript um, up on a split screen um, can make it a lot more easy to absorb, especially for like visual learners. Um, and it ensures that you don't miss anything out, especially like if maybe it's harder to hear the lecturer. Um, color coding important information to make links and associations in text easier. So I set out a specific system, so using blue for key terms, um, red for like key figures or dates, and purple for information that I find is going to be important or has been highlighted as important. Um, and that can help you kind of make visual links in the text. So if you see something, see a date and go, oh, this is linked to this, and it makes um, like factual recall a lot easier. So if you're making notes online, especially in Google Docs, there's an add comment function um, that you can use to add in things that you don't want to appear in the main body of text. This is something I found out not that long ago that I really like because if I have a question on something that hasn't been very clear to me, um, I can add it in and get, revisit it at a later date, or I can add like links to important websites or links to things that I think are quite interesting instead of just having it um, interrupting my notes. So, um, and finally, note-taking note -taking online can help you, um, you can use a heading function to help separate the document up. This is some, the, um, something that I learned in an internship that I did over the summer. Um, so you can create a navigatable contents page down the side of your document that if you wanted to just see a certain, um, certain bit of text that's quite far down in your document, you can just click on the link and it'll take you straight to it, which is a lot easier than having to just scroll through looking for this one bit of text. Okay, thank you very much, Amy. And um, I think this is kind of a, a good time for us to kind of move over to kind of questions that everyone, uh, you know, that have got, come across all our, to all our speakers so that, we can all kind of have a chat about the things that have worked and the things that haven't, because I think it was my key question about how do you motivate the students who find writing hard or the regular writing hard? Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave Alistair to chair the discussions if that's okay, Alistair. 
Yeah, that's okay. I was just actually writing a response to Mike, but I can, I'll can, i discuss it instead. Um, yeah, there's some loads and loads of comments in here, some brilliant things. I'm really pleased with the, the richness and variety that's come out in uh, from each of our different contributors. Um, I'm, I was just responding to the little thread that's developed about artificial intelligence, and um, I thought that might be an interesting one for us to um, open up for a little bit. Is it a threat or is it simply a threat to us um, asking people to write in unimaginative ways? I'd like to be interested in people's comments and, and do feel free either to do it in the chat or to open up a microphone. I actually have lots of thoughts about this, so I'm going to chime in real quickly yep. to say yep. that AI is out there and I never use turn it in. I, I preferred to do creative writing with my students and turn it in was not a tool I ever used. But for people who've been relying on turn it in, AI is going to up in your use of turn it in completely. And if you haven't explored the AI bots that are out there, the, the writing tools that students can use to generate original uh, automatically generated text based on a starting sentence, you should explore it and see what's out there because your students are going to be exploring it too. And I think we can use it creatively. I, I responded to Mike in the chat too, you know, so if there are auto summarizers out there and we know they're out there, well, have a contest in the class and see who can summarize better than the bot, right? Because this bot writing is not great. We can do better than the bots because we're, we're humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say instead of you know, trying to pretend that the tools don't exist, go out there, learn about them, ask your students about them, find out what your students' favorite tools are and figure out how to use them creatively because they're not going away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in terms of writing, um, you know, get your students to use the bots to write a sentence or to write a, um, you know, an article for you and then get them to mark it and to critique it. Yeah, very valid point, Rosemary, and, and that's why the kind of reflective writing thing or the more creative writing mm. aspects, um, I think bots would, would struggle with a little bit more. But um, something I learned from the assessment and HE conference, exactly, it, it's to kind of fight that use of, you know, essay writing, essay mills, um, it is to kind of, yeah, ask people to compare two pieces of writing because that's very hard <laughs> for an essay mill to, to, yes. to do for yeah. you. Um, so you could, you could ask an essay mill to generate uh, an essay, two essays on a topic, and then actually use those as your material and kind of say to the students, your job is to critique, compare, contrast, and what's missing, you know? So we can, we can kind of um, design better uh, essays and uh, uh, questions, shall we say, or mm. tasks. Are there any questions? I'm, I'm, I'm just putting this out to everybody um, now. Are there any elements from the session where you were thinking, oh, I really would like to get a solution or suggestions to answer this problem? And actually, we've had lots of interesting stuff, but nobody's talked about what I was wanting to talk about. Are there any bits that we've missed? we can use the hive mind of future teacher sessions. I'll give a couple of seconds, because if, if there's nothing, that's fine. That's great. But let's just see. And um, Ron's also asking, because some people may need to go a little bit early, uh, if people can put what one thing they're going to take away from this session in the text chat. So if there's nothing that we haven't covered that uh, and you're more than sated with the lunchtime uh, cognitive stimulation then pop into the text chat what it is what's the one thing you're going to go away and explore or use or look at um, if you've got questions or comments then keep keep, keep them coming it's, it's great to have people talking and hear your voices as well open up the microphones if you'd like to Dominic, do you want to say a little bit about the um, the resources you're putting together? Because they seem to be very interesting. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, yeah, I'm basically, I've sort of uh, started 
working on collating various technologies that people use for reading and writing. Uh, I mean, starting mostly with hardware for readings, like like e-readers and things like that. But it's uh, but more and more, I'm even looking like looking at different note-taking apps and how people can use them for various things, uh, collating sort of uh, and, and inviting both students and academics to come in and try those things out. You know, so mm. so looking at different ways of you know, being more productive. So I sort of rebadge the notion of study skills into calling it academic productivity and that's kind of a, that's a good one yeah and, and looking at looking at sort of how can you use these tools and combine the strategies and and, and, and things like that so so i'm actually uh if anybody wants to come to the next next week's accessibility uh clinic run by jisk uh, I'm, i'll be giving a much longer talk about the results of that work and what we, you know, what's what's available and, and so on. Oh, great. Have you got a link? If you could pop a link for that yeah, into will. the chat, I think people would be really interested. And if, if I may, uh, before, uh, just a quick reminder that ne next week is Dyslexia Awareness Week. Uh, and and we I actually put together a little sort of resource that, that goes, that sort of talks about people, how people can write to be more dyslexia friendly and format their documents. Oh, excellent. I'll link to that. And I'll, I'll put the link to the to to the uh, gist thing as well. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. We didn't particularly talk about note taking uh, because obviously writing and note taking are, are similar but not necessarily identical type of skills. But does anybody have any specific experience of tools? Because I noticed Dominic's um, web page had Notion. On there, I've recently started using a note-taking tool called Obsidian. We've obviously we've heard about OneNote uh, from a blogging perspective, but also for note-taking. I don't know if anybody else um, uses specific tools with students, recommends them, or has corporate versions. Lillian. Yeah, I was just gonna say um, that Abdul was asking, Ahmed was asking about uh, the navigation pane. I wonder if that's worth demonstrating as well well so if people are know know about the navigation pane then please do answer Alistair's question in the chat for now but I thought it might be useful to just demo and not assume that everyone knows the the navigation pane trick <laughs> yeah. um so if if we come away and everybody understands this this would be would be great but I've just got a google document up and And, and so, um, oops, hopefully I'm still online. <laughs> and so what you would want to, so using the styles up here to turn that into a heading. And then the next style, making that a heading too. And you'll see on the left-hand side, the navigation pane a structure that's beginning to appear. So, so that's that's learning to use these so that you can kind of jump about a long document uh, way more easily, like this. So I'll stop share. It gets to this time of day when America wakes up. I know Laura's already awake, but America <laughs> wakes up and the internet seems to really struggle a little bit in the afternoon. Uh, that was fine. Uh, sorry, you go. I was just going to quickly show how this works in Word because Word actually adds quite a few new features. That's just uh, what I was thinking of. So that's great. I'm really which pleased. Which is why I prefer that, yeah. it to Google Docs. Otherwise, I, I quite like Google Docs for many features. But this is so. This is actually my draft for the website about Dyslexia Awareness Week. And as you can see, I go to View and I have the navigation pane. I can sort of open. It. I always have it open. And as Lillian said. You use the styles. Here's a quick tip. Just what I found something I've noticed what, what you were doing, Lillian. Actually, there is a trick. You don't have to select the whole paragraph, the whole line to change in the style. It's actually safer to just click in the line that you want to make into that style. And I always have this kind of open, this style explorer open that uh, that you can sort of change to headings. And I, I use keyboard shortcuts. So as I work, I just kind of make things up. But in the in the in here, I can also collapse things. And I can say, I only want to see, there's this sort of show heading levels, only levels up to level two. So I don't see as many details. I can promote and demote entire subsections here so that I can actually manage my outline. 
And so that's really that's really good. I use that all the time. And the other thing that I can do, uh, only in Word on Windows, for some reason that doesn't work on Mac, I can actually grab and move things around. So I can I can take this and have that whole section and everything with it comes to the place. So I don't have to sort of copy and paste uh, and lose where I am and lose data and all of that. So that's that's just gonna, that's like one of the benefits in Word. So I use this all the time just to manage my document as well as to do other things. And obviously the final trick once that I'm sure people know, but if you don't, once you've done all of that, you, can, you get a table of contents for free. So when you, you're just gonna go to your, uh, and that's the same in Google, your references, table of contents, one click and it's there, uh, you know, all the pagination. So as somebody mentioned, it saves your, it could save you days of, of your life if you're, if you're writing a thesis. Uh, and, and trying to do a table of contents and you change something, you have to kind of keep up to date. And then you just simply, when something changes, you simply right click and say uh, update field or so update table and you can update the table or just numbers and so on. Sorry, I just, I always kind of uh, <laughs> proselytize about this. So I, I could not resist an opportunity to do that here again. It's, it's too exciting, too life-changing for people that have never used it before to um, just assume. In fact, there was, I noticed somebody else had said that, you know, it's, we can make assumptions. I think Laura, Laura Hollinshead was saying, you know, it's interesting to understand our assumptions about students' abilities to write. I think that's a really good point. You know, what do we assume that they know and don't know? Um, and I think that that approach that you're taking, Dominic, with the study skills actually being about productivity, um, that's uh, perhaps an easier way of selling it to people. Any other uh, interesting tools, technologies that people use uh, in their day-to-day -day work? I've got a very exciting new trick that I've taken to using. Um, well, I mean, apart from Paper Pile's got its own kind of note-taking, so you highlight and you can make notes. So I presume other things like, I don't know, I don't use... Mendeley or, or the others, but I presume all the referencing software have some kind of ability to note take. But Paper Pile has been great because um, you can export all your notes as well. So you can do other things with them, not have them just hidden within the document. Uh, and then for um, the ultimate in, in note taking, I um, let, let, let's, I'll see if I can share screen again without it breaking. Those of us who are learning technologies like this, this kind of thing, right? That we can share technologies. So I use Reader View quite a lot to read things that have lines that are way too long for me. Um, but if if you've never tried it, um, it it's got a little post-it note thing, and you can kind of leave yourself notes uh, about this blog. So if you come back to something you've visited before, because I sometimes end up going around in circles and revisiting a journal article I've already read, I can see that I've read, I can see that I've read it. And it reminds me that, oh, you know, you've already read it. Um, so I've turned it off, turn it back on and look, it, it's back here. So this is Reader View, which is like the Mozilla Firefox uh, simple reader, um, but you can install it on Chrome as well. And it just simplifies reading and a little bit of help with writing. I've just started um, using the Obsidian app um, for writing things. It's got a bit of a learning curve because of you know you you almost have to learn a, not not quite coding but a bit of markdown. Uh, there's a few simple things that you have to learn, although much much fewer than I thought. But what I'm loving is the way I can. Make, I'm using it to make notes on things I'm reading about and studying about and just the way I can make links. And um, I love the point that uh, Amy made about, you know, you're writing something and you suddenly think of something, but you don't know where to put it, put it in a comment. Um, that That's a great idea. And I can do that in a very simple way with Obsidian as well. But the best thing for me is that I can view my notes in lots of different ways as a mind map, I can sort of just open up and it shows all the connections to all the different things and um, and it's taggable and um, you know, a very powerful way of pulling together note taking so that I could then create something, an article or something based on it. You've, you've reminded may I, me, oh sorry, 
May I say uh, something? Go ahead, Ahmed. All right. Uh, I found that the, there's a tool called Draw in Microsoft 365, especially for teaching a second language mm -hmm. like what, what you see in yes. my background. Very simple tools and it's effective. You try it in, in, um, in words, but it has to be in 365 Microsoft Office. Okay. Yeah. And do you want to pop the pop the name of the tool back in the chat? Draw. There? A draw. It's as simple as that. It's okay. called a draw. And it's I... very important in a, in a language such as Arabic. When uh, once you move that online, the script is. Oh, uh, right. Absolutely. Yeah, I can yeah. I can write uh, wherever I want to write, yeah. and then the student actually can follow me and write instead of a whiteboard, for example. Mm. And it's very controllable, you know. I imagine, I imagine it would be very useful if you're teaching uh, Mandarin as well. Any Absolutely. script where you've got, yes, yeah, yeah. something. Th those of us who teach languages are aware that some languages are much more fortunate than <laughs> others when it comes to technologies. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, and this is from a linguistic perspective, really, that the comments and the conversation we've been having, um, uh, you've been drawing attention to something that we haven't actually made explicit, which is if we if we want good writing, we need lots of reading first. Yeah. Um, so the strategies that we've mentioned around reading strategies and annotation, um, modeling and examples that have all been mentioned during today's session, you know, it, good writing doesn't come from just nowhere it no. comes from our reading and our exposure and uh, the poetry the short stories the micro blogging the blogging um, all of these things are vital for really good writing performance we've reached the um 